Yes, okay, so I'm going to be talking about open source brain uh, at the moment, and it's been mentioned a few times already, so I'll hopefully skip over some of the introductions. Um, but basically, the, yeah, the motivation for this is very similar to the motivation for um, a lot of other initiatives. Uh, we really want to make uh, computational neuroscience more scientific, more rigorous, and the ways we've identified to actually try to do this, or the shortcomings, is uh, the problems with reproducibility. Uh, there's models out there, code is out there, but it would be very good if you could actually reproduce in full or reproduce in your system of your choice um, the results from that paper. And it's not necessarily always the case, even if you've got the Fortran code sitting there. Um, accessibility, it's not just computational neuroscientists we want to have looking at these models and improving them. We also want to make them accessible to theoretical experimental neuroscientists. Uh, portability, everybody uses their own simulator, maybe rebuilds the simulator. It would be good if you weren't limited to the um, uh, format that the original model was built in. And transparency, um, ideally for really complex models, you need to be able to drill down to the specifics of that and that shouldn't involve opening up a, a text editor and reading uh, uh, thousands of lines of code. So we want to make some kind of way to uh, expose these internal physiological properties of models and make them uh, open to critical evaluation. So Open Source Brain Repository, it's online, it's at opensourcebrain.org. A uh, bit of background for this, it's been around for probably just over five years. It's been funded by the Wellcome Trust, generously. Um, and the key aim of this is to have an open source model development repository specifically for computational neuroscience. And what it actually consists of is a database of well-tested spiking neuron and network models in standardized formats. Now, we're concentrating on spiking uh, neuron models simply because that's what we know most about, but a lot of the processes we use, a lot of the tools we use are applicable for any other types of uh, neuronal modeling like neural mass models and we have some base, uh, initial interactions with some people from those fields as well. Uh, but the key thing we're trying to do is allow anyone to come along, comment on, extend, reuse the models um, that we have on this and really build a collaboration platform, so not just the people who've provided the models, put the scripts up there, and you ask them questions, but anybody can come along. If it's interesting for the community, they can contribute to it, they can make it better, they can document it. Um, and we want to use the, the best way to do, actually do this is to use the best tools and practices that you've just heard about for, that have been developed and are very successful in um, open source software development. So what types of models do we actually have already on open source brain? We have a number of models, uh, cell and network models from the neocortex, thalamus, I won't go through these in great detail, uh, cerebellum, mainly because we're interested in that in the silver lab, um, hippocampus, but also some classic models like uh, the Prince and Martyr pyloric pacemaker network, some more abstract neural networks, uh, examples, uh, Fitzhugh Nagumo, Izakevich, and also linking to ongoing projects like Openworm, uh, which is also available on uh, opensourcebrain.org. So for these models here, these model types, they're available on ModelDB. Uh, you can download most of these and run them in the particular simulator they were developed in. So what's the advantage for actually developing these further on uh, open source brain? So to give an example of this, um, give an example of the 2005 paper by Roger Traub and colleagues. Uh, this was a very detailed model at 14 different cell types, uh, a single uh, column thalamocortical network model, 14 different cell types, multi-compartmental neurons. Each of these had distinct uh, distributions of ion channels and showed a number of properties of um, uh, telomocortical networks. Uh, but one of the issues with this, it was very good. It was very well described in the paper. But, and you could download code, it was open source, but it was about 20,000 lines of Fortran code. And not very many people, even the authors on the paper, had actually used this code. But it, this was interesting for a number of different people and a number of groups over the years have taken this, taken on board to try to convert this to other formats. So what you actually have on Open Source Brain now is a, a project page corresponding to this model uh, for a telemocortical network model. Um, and on here, you get a list of the various people. Uh, there's groups in uh, Poland, in India, Michael Hines in the um, uh, Neuron has also worked extensively on this. People who are interested in this model and are interested in making it more accessible and moving it forward. You also get a link here to the original model code on uh, ModelDB and a warning that's in Fortran. But what you also get is a link for each of these projects on Open Source Brain to a GitHub repository. Now, hopefully I don't have to say too much about GitHub, but um, the basic idea here is that it's uh, an open source code sharing website and uh, corresponding to this you have 
a number of different versions of this model here, the original Fortran code, a version that's been converted to Moose and Neuron, and NeuroConstruct version, which contains NeuroML. Um, and the people who are interested in this have contributed these various different uh, pieces of code. And the great thing about GitHub is you can actually see all the history of who has actually worked on this, the various different versions of this, and you can also find out who's making the most contributions to this, making the most useful um, uh, contributions. And you associated with each of these commits, uh, you have uh, some comments and for branches as well. I mean, as an example here, if you could read this, it says version which works on my computer. Now, this is very valuable information. If you find that original code, you're looking through the Fortran and you actually say, oh, it's actually Helena, who's here, uh, has actually at one point got the code to work on her computer, which is a very, very useful information rather than just getting a, a zip file and trying to run it yourself on your computer. So this is the whole idea of collaboration and also assigning credit for the various people who are working on this. Um, and so associate also with the uh, projects on Open Source Brain, there's a wiki. Uh, so here, uh, in this model, um, Roger Traub himself admitted in the paper that it's very preliminary, but there is a place where people can come and discuss the various limitations with the models, some of the difficulties installing it, but also the physiological properties of the model. And you also actually get a, here a form, uh, in this example here, uh, I believe Helena again has uh, tried to reproduce the, uh, some of the figures from the paper in the, in the slightly updated Fortran and in her version of Neuron. So again, this is making the um, model more accessible, proving uh, what it can actually do, and you can actually see what people have uh, done with it here. So it's a way for groups to get together, interested in specific areas, and to move interesting models forward, um, and all in open source. But obviously, if you have five different versions of the model in different uh, simulators, that's not necessarily best. Maybe somebody fixes a bug in one of them and improves it in one. So what you actually need is a common format that you can express uh, models like this, which can then be mapped to the um, simulators of choice for different people. So that's, as you've heard mention of already, uh, what's enabled by NeuroML. So hopefully most of you will have heard of this before, but it's a standardized language for model descriptions in computational neuroscience. Uh, the most stable version of this has concentrated on detailed neuronal morphologies, ion channels, synapses, and 3D network structure, the types of um, uh, computational multi-compartmental models that have been traditionally uh, built on neuron and genesis. Um, and over the years, uh, there's about 30, over 30 different simulators, applications, databases have added support for NeuroML in some form or other. So here's just a few of them here. So you have the kind of traditional neuronal simulators like Neuron, Genesis, and Moose, but you also have databases like Neuromorpho. There's about seven or 8,000 cells on Neuromorpho that you can download in NeuroML format. Channelpedia you can also uh, download from the Bluebrain project, uh, a lot of these ion channels in NeuroML format. Other tools for maybe generating neuronal morphologies, CX3D, there's a version of this so you can generate a network in 3D, export it to Neuron. And there's a number of other tools and initiatives here which are using various forms of this. So, as I mentioned, it's being used as a common format for exchanging between these uh, applications. But um, one of the limitations um, that was uh, present in the version one of NeuroML was that it was very focused on multi-compartmental, Hodgkin-Huxley-based uh, models. So what we really wanted to do for version two was to try to make it more extensible so that you can build new model types, maybe more abstract models, uh, on top of this language. Um, and, and as an example of the type of uh, model we want to try to incorporate in version two, this uh, Breton Gerstner uh, model of adaptive exponential integrating fire cell, it's just two uh, ODEs, uh, but by changing some of the parameters in this model, uh, you can reproduce, quite similar to the uh, Izakevich model, uh, you can reproduce a lot of different spiking behaviors of uh, uh, neurons from multiple brain regions. So this would be great to get into uh, NeuroML 2, in NeuroML 1, what we would have had to do would be update the specification, update each of the individual implementations. But what we have in version 2, and I won't go through this in any great detail, is a language that we're calling LEMS, which, uh, where you can actually specify these differential equations here in a machine-readable format, unambiguously, and then for the NeuroML, corresponding NeuroML2 element, you just specify which parameters. It points back to the definition of this in LEMS, and so in this way you get a full machine-readable um, 
implementation of that model. And then this can be used to generate code from multiple different simulators. So we can map this to MATLAB, XBP, Neuron, and so on. And so when somebody comes up with a new type of Neuron model that they'd like to uh, support in the format, all you do is implement this in this language here. And it's convertible to other formats like 9ML as well. Um, and in this way, the language <coughs> can be extensible. So we have, in the current version of uh, NeuroML, NeuroML 2, the third beta release is just about to be released, uh, a hierarchy of these elements, so for describing cell models, describing synapse models, and other inputs like voltage clamps and so on. Behind the scenes for all of these, there's a machine-readable description. And if the language gets extended with a new um, synapse type, you can just go to the de description, and then it should be uh, supported in all of the um, simulators which can support LEMS, which can read this and convert it to the new format. So that's what we're trying to do for uh, NeuroML. And the idea is with Open Source Brain that uh, if you get your model into this format, all the possibilities which are opened up through having it in this machine readable format uh, and all the code generation possibilities will be open to all of these models. So you can list on Open Source Brain. Uh, Lots of these models, there's about 80, 70 or 80 different models in different stages of development and curation. Uh, but for each of these, you can see where it is with the current level of support. For example, uh, in uh, Neuron and Genesis, how well it's supported and whether it's supported in NeuroML2. And what we really want to do is fill out this as much as possible. So for models that aren't covered in NeuroML, just extend the language, uh, build support new types in there. But also, actually, we've developed a testing framework for each of these. So as what we want to do is not just say, yes, you can download this and it will run in Neuron, to actually have uh, uh, software tests which look at this, generate the, uh, download the simulator, run the model in that particular simulator, test that it actually is identical to what you're predicting. Uh, and then, if you follow these links here, you actually get a log of which version of software was used, which version of the model, what it actually did, so that if you come back to it in two years' time, you know that it has worked. So th this is slightly different testing that uh, Rick will talk about later. It's more software testing that it actually does what you're expecting it to do. OK. Um, so just to give one or two more examples of types of models that are on uh, open source brain, you all have heard of the Izakevich spiking neuron model. Uh, and this, again, reproduces multiple different types of behavior for uh, uh, simple, in a simple neuron model. Uh, this was, has been for a long time available in MATLAB from uh, Izakevich's website. But now there's an uh, open source brain repository with a version on Pine. So not only NeuroML, a lot of the models uh, that we are supporting there are well expressed or available in Pine, which is Python based uh, multi um, simulator uh, language for expressing uh, neuronal models. Um, and also NeuroML format. And you can actually go to the uh, wiki associated with this, and there's a brief explanation of some minor parameter changes which were needed in the, from the original MATLAB code to get this to run properly on NeuroML and uh, Pine. And this work was actually completed uh, in 2013 by a, as part of the Google Summer of Code by a, a Brazilian student, Vitor Schaud. Um, and yeah. So, so basically, there's a record now that I'm sure multiple different uh, students have found when they download that MATLAB code. Maybe they have to make some minor modifications, but now there's a place that people can actually check through this and maybe add support for a new simulator or um, comment again on that particular piece of code. So for um, uh, this year as well, there's a Google Summer of Code student looking at uh, network models of V1. Um, and this student, uh, Ramon Martinez, has actually identified some classic papers, some classic models of um, orientation selection in uh, orientation selection in V1. Um, and ha the code for these models hasn't actually been available, but what he's done is read the paper and implemented this in a set of Pine scripts. So now if you follow the GitHub repository for this, you find a nice clean set of um, uh, scripts in Pine, which reproduce some of the figures from those papers and can be reused for other models of V1. Uh, and the, again, the good thing about this is that um, Ramon's name will be all over these codes here. So if somebody does uh, take those, to develop new models, that's uh, good. G credit will be given to the people who've actually um, uh, developed these scripts. So while Converting an old uh, paper into Pine doesn't necessarily get you a publication. It does get you exposure uh, for uh, whoever uses that further down the line. OK, so that's great that you have um, models in 
neuromel and pine, so if it runs and does exactly the same as the original version, what is the actual advantage of converting it to there? And the big advantage, as you've seen already, is that once we know what's actually in that GitHub repository on open source brain itself, we can pull that in and extract that information out of it, where it would be much more difficult if it was in uh, C++ or Neuron or so on. Uh, so here's an example of what we do. There's a uh, open source brain project for the Purkinje cell from De Schutter and Bauer. Uh, and we have a 3D visualizer on open source brain that you've seen a little bit of already, which has pulled in that uh, NeuroML file from the GitHub repository. And you can visualize this inside your browser. As long as your browser supports WebGL, you'll be able to use this even on your mobile phone. And since there's information in this file as well about the uh, locations of the ion channels, so for example, potassium and sodium channels where it's actually located in the soma or the thick dendrite, uh, or even the leak um, conductances, and it varies over the, uh, uh, the dendritic tree here. All this information can be pulled out and presented in your browser without having to install any software or anything else. And the only requirement on the uh, repository developer is that they put it in there in compliant uh, NeuroML. So show another example of this. This is uh, the Traub uh, network model which has also been converted to NeuroML. And this is just a 300 cell, 10% uh, of the full network, uh, which is again being visualized on OSB. And you can see the structure of the model as we have it in 3D, uh, the different cell types that are actually present in there. You can go in, look at the overall structure, maybe click on one of the cells, uh, and then see, OK, which cell type this is. This is layer 5 tufted pyramidal cell, uh, and just make this very complex model, much more uh, accessible to people who would never actually install Neuron or know what to do with the Fortran code, um, and make it easier for people to comment on this, to say, well, this particular cell type is missing, or if you click on a cell and say, well, there's actually uh, IH present on a different location, what we really want to do is lower the, boundary, lower the barriers to actually accessibility and use of these models. Um, so I've mentioned, well, we've heard already about uh, OpenWorm, and this example here really demonstrates the advantages for both OSB and OpenWorm that uh, we have um, a nice model to actually show on open source brain, and we can visualize this in 3D, as we can see. Um, but the big advantage of this is that uh, all the code for this is shared, is publicly available. So the elements that we're using for this visualizer here are actually shared with the OpenWorm community. So if there's improvements made there to this visualization capability, uh, we benefit from that. Any uh, extra things we implement for uh, parsing NeuroML models um, can be reused by them also. And just to give an, a quick example of that, uh, Stephen has mentioned Geppetto, and we have started uh, a more up-to-date uh, model of uh, C. elegans, which is fully specified in NeuroML. These are actually just integrate and fire neuron models. It's just showing the somas here of these models. But the new features we're trying to build into the OSB visualizer and into Geppetto is actually simulating uh, the model inside the browser. So this is, Geppetto has loaded up a NeuroML uh, file containing a description, an integrate and fire network for this model, and you can actually press start. And what you can actually see is activity in each of these neurons uh, in the browser. You can see some of the cells uh, start to light up there. But basically, um, the components behind the scenes for running this model are in NeuroML. We're developing those. The components for visualizing this uh, are being updated by the OpenWorm people. And none of this would have been possible unless we're both sharing our code, sharing all the models, working on the areas that we have expertise in, and then putting online and enabling the community to come along and use these tools. OK, so just to wrap up, those uh, elements that I've shown are really uh, trying to address these really important issues of reproducibility, accessibility to computational and non-computational people, portability across different uh, simulators, and transparency, being able to drill down into the models, very complex models, and uh, get comments and feedback and input from as many different people as possible. So we have uh, quite a number of people signed up, nearly 300 members, 43 different research groups in opensourcebrain.org, uh, about 80 different projects and various levels of um, uh, conversion to NeuroML and Pine. Um, and they, I just point out again this very big button on the home page here, sign up. Everybody here and anyone else in the community is very welcome to come along, put up whatever kind of models you want on GitHub. You have complete control of your GitHub repository. If you support NeuroML and Pine, 
we will do as many interesting things as we can with it and publicize it on the website. And we really want to build a community about this and improve models, improve accessibility of um, what you're doing with those and basically build better, more scientific models. So finally, just to acknowledge a number of people here, not just in Silver Lab, but uh, a lot of our collaborators that we work with, very close work with the Open Worm Project, uh, NeuroML community, and uh, support from the UK INCF node, and of course, Wolfram Trust. So, thank you. Any questions for Porik? Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, can you make a comment regarding 9ML? I mean, because I was wondering, I mean, obviously there's sort of, especially in the context of INCF, I mean, there, were, there was an additional development, and do you see that this is now converging, or sort of how, how can... Um, it, more is happening now, I think, with 9ML. Um, there are some updates to the repository there. Um, for us, LEMS is the, roughly the equivalent to uh, what 9ML, uh, the new features that 9ML enables. We do actually have, as part of our import and export features, you can um, actually, most of those models there, you can uh, attempt to export them into 9ML. So if there is a simulator which only supports 9ML, uh, we can export uh, valid 9ML out from uh, a NeuroML description into that format and hopefully load it up into another simulator. Um, it's not complete, um, it needs testing, but again, there's a file there, 9ML writer, which anybody can update and make sure that it's valid. Um, we, we do want to have uh, greater compatibility with these, um, but we do think, well, we're biased, but we do think there are some features in LEMS that you need, like hierarchical expression and extension that um, are there at the moment in LEMS that could be uh, imported into uh, 9ML as well. But um, the key thing we want to do is just make sure they're compatible and open and, yeah, so, yeah. Very nice talk, thank you. Um, so you talked about uh, the value of, of being able to convert your model from like one simulator to another. Did you have any interest in um, trying to convert one model from a different uh, neuron model to another. So for example, I had a student who, uh, who tried to take, uh, I don't think it was one of the models you showed, it was a Rubin and Terman model from like, I don't know, 10 years ago. And they'd, they'd done it in um, some sort of Hodgkin-Huxley type simulator. And, and we tried to convert it to an Izzy-Kevich model. Okay. Um, and, you know, hijinks ensued as it sort of half worked. Um, but I mean, is that the kind of, is that something that would be of potential interest to, to try different um, realizations of, of the same Yeah, model. I mean, in theory, somebody could, I mean, supporting uh, uh, NeuroML, uh, you could potentially uh, develop a, a tool, a library, which reads in any NeuroML model, and you say, right, try to reproduce this behavior in a different type of NeuroML model. I mean, it's conceivable that you could do that. You'd have to re-optimize your model according to those parameters, but uh, what NeuroML actually provides is the input for a hodgkin huxley model, the output, Izakevich, this bit in the middle for how you would actually do that is not necessarily something that NeuroML solves, but it w might enable you. I mean, the other scenario is that you just create a GitHub repository saying converting HH models into Izakevich and then put it up there, put some examples up there, send an email, and hopefully somebody will help you doing that. Um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's not a difficult, not an incredibly difficult problem, but uh, it's an interesting approach to take, um, and there are probably some people out there who might want to contribute to this, so, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I think at one point I've heard it, I heard it discussed that there was going to be, or there was some work on a high, high resolution or high density network model, or network serialization that would not be XML. Is, do you have any updates on that? Uh, there is a library called uh, LibNeuroML, which um, was in the, two th I didn't mention, but it was in the 2012 uh, INCF Google Summer of Code, and thank you again, INCF, which was developed by Mike Feller, which does support much larger, it doesn't require you to save your uh, morphologies into 
um, XML every time and read it back in. It does use a Mongo database for a, serialize, a more efficient seriali more efficient seriali serialization of the model. It has some options for saving that to HDF5 as well, but it's NeuroML compliant. So you can load up a NeuroML model or regenerate a NeuroML model and say, save it into one of these other formats, uh, which should be much faster to read and write or more compact, and then load it back up again. And because you're using an API, you just deal with the same NeuroML elements. Um, uh, this has been uh, out there, it's published, it's open, and um, I believe it's still, it, it does still work. Um, uh, so that might be something to look in. But um, there's definitely a lot more that can be done with um, uh, making the, for example, the HDF5 much more efficient and uh, the, the formats you actually save it in. You don't necessarily need to s save all the XML strings. You could save a much more compact representation of that for reading in and reading out. But as long as you have an object model, maybe defined by NeuroML, that you can handle, then you don't really care how it's actually saved in. <laughs>